Great. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to um, introduce Mike Hoffman. Mike Hoffman is Executive Director of the Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions. Uh, and this institute was created to help raise the profile of the challenges created by climate change and to help those who grow our food adapt to the changing conditions, as well as to reduce the carbon net carbon footprint. As Executive Director, he provides visionary leadership in this institute and shares the climate change story with a wide range of audience, including his TEDx talk, Climate Change, It's Time to Raise Our Voices. He also serves as co-chair of the President's Sustainability Campus Committee and is very involved in helping to lead climate change literacy here at Cornell. Um, and this is a climate change initi literacy initiative for students, staff, and faculty. Previously, uh, Mike has held positions at Cornell, including director of the Cornell University Agriculture Experiment Station, associate dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and associate director of the Cornell Cooperative Extension, and director of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. He is a professor in the Department of Entomology. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me okay in the back and up in the front? Good. I'm going to start with a few questions. How many of you eat? I don't see. Uh, okay, just about everybody. How many of you drink coffee? Aha, uh -huh. we're friends. Chocolate. You drink or eat chocolate? How many drink beer? And you're over 21. <laughs> okay, I have my iPhone, I guess that. So I guess I'm in the right place. Lastly, how many are concerned about climate change? Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna provide an outline of my talk. I'm gonna cover the fundamental changes that are occurring to our diet and our food due to climate change. And I'll use some case studies these are really exciting stories. Challenges and opportunities for global quinoa market as sea levels rise. That's a great story. Impact of heat waves on the flavor of kale in Minnesota. Another great story. Effects of rising CO2 levels on banana peel thickness. Anybody heard of that one? Actually, neither have I. <laughs> and then lastly, challenges and opportunities for spelt with a changing climate. And then I'll wrap it up and we'll have Q&A. Are you all ready? Is that okay? Or would this be a little better? How climate change is messing with your favorite chocolate, coffee, lettuce, tomatoes, almonds, apples, avocado, lobster, and whatever, and beer. Is that a little better? Would that be better? Please say yes. Because I didn't prepare a talk for the other. Anybody ever had coffee out of one of those lovely little containers there in the lower right? That's how the Vietnamese make coffee. And I wish I had some right now. It's just awesome. That's my favorite, one of my favorites. So here we go. The real outline. I talked about how climate change is affecting the plants we depend on for life. How getting that food to the table is getting a little riskier. The supply chain is changing. We're going out to dinner with a real menu, and I hope you have your credit cards. We're talking about solutions and opportunities right here at Cornell, go Big Red. And then, what do we do? Is that better? It's okay to interact, it's all right. You can throw things too. Okay, a little summary. CO2 is up 40%, I think you know all this. It's warmer, about two degrees warmer. The water cycle, the global water cycle is changing. We're the cause, transportation, electricity, industry are big players. Sometimes agriculture is picked on a little too much, but in a given time span, in the US, agriculture contributes about 9% of the greenhouse gases, worldwide it's 18. Sometimes agriculture is put at the top. So it's changing our menu. And I doubt anyone has looked at climate change this way, but think of a bathtub as the atmosphere. I can talk about those legs later if anybody's interested. They're not mine. 
But think of 200 years ago, the drain is where greenhouse gases from the atmosphere absorbed by the oceans, the plants. The faucet was just right. Greenhouse gases coming into the atmosphere and it was in balance. But now that faucet is turned up. The drain is still the same size. The atmosphere, the bathtub is filling up. So what does this mean to the plants we depend on for life? To grow and reproduce, plants need air, CO2, water, the right temperature, soil, and sunlight. Everything is changing except sunlight. That remains the same. Changes in CO2. You hear the argument, oh, more CO2 in the atmosphere, that's a good thing. Plants will go fast, faster. Yields will be higher. In general, yes, if you're a C3 type plant, that's about 95% percent of the plants on the planet, including our crop plants. But the consensus is any increase will be offset by higher temperatures and water stress. So we're not going to gain anything with more CO2. Weeds are hard to control, will become harder to control. In control studies where weeds were grown under higher and higher levels of CO2, glyphosate, which is used on tens of millions of acres, the herbicide in the US, actually begins to fail. The plants, the weeds become harder to control. As an entomologist, the next one is really cool. Insects eat more on plants that are grown at higher and higher levels of CO2. The thought was, well, the nutrients are diluted. The, the plants are growing faster and bigger. The plants, the insects also live longer and have more babies. Researchers in Illinois using out of doors facilities that increase the CO2, found that insects on feeding on soybean responded this way. They lived longer and they couldn't quite understand. Then they looked under more controlled conditions and found out that the plants, defense systems shut down with that higher CO2 level. What normally happens, an insect would feed on the soybean, the plant generates these enzymes, affects the insect gut, not anymore at higher CO2. That's why they were living longer. Luzisca, ARS USDA has done some really cool work with protein content in goldenrod, which is the final, is kind of the end of the year source of pollen for bees. He collected pollen from museum collections starting in 1849 to current times. And what did he see? A 30% drop in protein over that 100 year period. They're not sure what this means to the bees, but the protein is definitely lower. The one that's a little concerning, maybe the most concerning, is human nutrition. Plants grown under conditions of 2050, 500 parts per million, 550 parts per million, have 3 to 17% less protein, less iron, less zinc, and supplies to many crops. This means that 175 million more people will be zinc deficient by mid-century because of this change. The greatest impact will be South and Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. On the upside, lettuce, when grown under higher CO2 levels, actually becomes sweeter. Changes in water, where it falls, global shifts and patterns of precipitation, how it falls, there'll be more downpours, the form's gonna change. More rain, less snow, and glaciers are melting. What's shown here depicted on the world map? Never mind. Find where we are, upstate New York. You'll notice it's darker blue. There will be more rain falling here toward the end of the century than now. All wet areas of the world will get wetter, dry areas drier. Now look to the southwest and western US, much, much drier. In fact, one of our faculty here predicts with a 99% probability that a 35 year mega drought will hit the Southwest. That in part is natural, but made worse with climate change. So there's going to be winners and losers. How it falls. The map shows the incident of heavy precipitation events. So the Northeast is up 71%, these downpours. The Midwest about 40% and the West less so. But pretty much everywhere, we're getting more of these heavy precipitation events 
their downpours. And it makes it tough to farm. This is a quote on the right from a farmer near here. As a farmer, you can weather the storm, but you can't weather continuous storms. In the Midwest, a couple of years ago, Libby Pumpkin, how many pumpkin pie? I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep asking. You're gonna get, you can, you can ask me later on, but right now I'm gonna ask you questions. How many eat pumpkin pie? All right, and most of that is made with Lippy's processed pumpkins. But one year, about three years ago, they didn't have much of a crop because they couldn't plant, it was too wet. A year later, they couldn't harvest, it was too, also too wet. But they grew all the pumpkins 90 miles, within 90 miles of the processing plant. Moral of the story, diversify your risk, spread out. Change in form. Precipitation is going to fall more like rain and less like snow. And the large red dots represent a shift of 40% from snow to rain between the years 1949 and 2015. So in general, more rain, less snow. This is a really big deal in the Western Rockies and Sierras because they depend on that winter snowpack that then melts in the spring to provide water for agriculture in some of the cities, surface water. This past winter has been remarkable. They've actually caught up, lots of snow. The other thing is it melts earlier in the spring and runs off faster. But the general trend is less and less snowpack in the Western mountains, which has serious implications for agriculture in California and the Pacific Northwest. How many have walked or driven through the San Joaquin Valley in California, seen the agriculture? If you get a chance, do that someday. It's remarkable. The miles and miles and miles of, some would criticize, but perfectly laser straight rows, miles of lettuce. This is probably Salinas Valley, almonds, pistachios, fruit, etc. And it's all taken care of in part by that water from the Sierras and that's changing. Ice melts. In Peru, since 1980, they've actually expanded agriculture by about 100,000 acres. When I go to the grocery shopping, usually at Wegmans, I look, and sure enough, the blueberries usually come from Peru or Chile. But there's more aeration water now because the glaciers are melting faster, but by 2050, they'll be gone. And that will have a huge impact on that agricultural regions, which right now, from which we buy $4 billion worth of fresh fruit and vegetables every year, most often during the winter, our winter. Himalayas, much longer term, but the same shift is happening. More melt waters right now, and in the long term, hundreds, maybe thousands of years, that source will be gone. Temperature, it's warming but it's not simple. If it's cool now, it will get warmer. So cool regions are warming faster than warm regions. Northern Canada is warming faster than San Diego. Cold seasons warm faster than warm seasons. U.S. winters are warming twice as fast as the summers. Cool nights are warming faster than days. In fact, about 20% faster here in the U.S. And these have subtle impacts. Warm nights actually reduce the yield of rice. More heat waves have impacts on many crops. Here, a couple, one to three day heat extreme will reduce the yield of wheat. Same thing happens in maize or corn. Because winters are warming, production is moving north. The upper figure shows USDA plant hardiness zones. And between 1990 and 2012, the zones move one zone north. You notice the best way to look at it, just look at the, the black area at the top and you can see it's much smaller on the right. That zone has moved into Canada and the Canadians are happy. They are expanding grain production tremendously. We could not grow canola in New York in 1990 because the winters were too cold. Now we can. Lower right, the growing season is longer. The frost-free season essentially from the last frost in the spring to the first in the fall, that time period has expanded. We've gained about 10, 14 days. 
The West has gained about 20 days. For us, that sounds really good. Farmers can plant longer crops, longer season crops, different crops. Unfortunately, with these downpours, it's often cold and too wet in the spring to plant, and then pretty much bound by the old, much shorter season length because of these precipitation events. This is one not everyone is aware of, but all fruit, almost all fruit and nut crops require a winter dormancy period called the winter chill. And as winters warm, this is gonna have the greatest impact where currently winters are mild like California. So what's shown here is winter chilling for, uh, time in 1950 on the left, all the way to 2090. And you can see it goes from roughly 1200 to 1500 in 1950, chilling hours to zero to 250 towards the end of the century. That will have a huge impact on California fruit and nut crops. We'll be okay up here because it's still going to be cold. In 2017, Georgia, the peach state, didn't have any peaches. The winter was too warm, so the fruit simply didn't set. Pistachios, in 2015, I believe, pistachio crop in California got creamed. They lost three to $500 million in production because they didn't have that winter chill period. And this is clearly going to continue and get worse. Also looking at California, this is just looking out well, looking out to the year 2100 and increasing temperatures only, not considering water or any other factor. But in general, most crops uh, decline in yield. Maize, tomato, this, I'm looking at the business as usual line, which is the darker one, rice, wheat, cotton, and sunflower. A few stay the same, alfalfa, well, and, uh, and uh, safflower. This is the one that really worries me. Ice cream might melt faster. <laughs> and in preparing for the talk, I have actually found out that um, one of the big ice cream companies is developing an ice cream that doesn't melt. I hope it tastes good. Not because of climate change. I think it's just so it's not as messy and you can give it to kids like this and they can still have fun, but they'll make a mess. Changes to the soil. The skin of the earth, it functions to purify water, it stores water, it plays a huge role in the atmosphere, and so it holds about 80% of the terrestrial carbon, but it also is changing. With increasing storms, we have more erosion, loss of nutrients, higher temperatures, more breakdown of organic matter and loss of carbon, and more evapotranspiration, which essentially just evaporating from the soil, but also the plants, it's kind of a double whammy for the plant. The plant's under stress, and then the higher temperatures are taking moisture from the soil. And the plants in the ocean, phytoplankton, they're the basis for life, the food chain in the ocean, and they're changing as well. In the Indian Ocean, there's been about a 20% decline. Again, this is the basis of life, in the oceans, the whole food chain, and it is also changing. You notice I'm not saying doom and gloom, I'm just saying changing. Well, it is doom and gloom, but I'm just gonna say changing. And what's important, the phytoplankton actually play a major role in, in the producing oxygen for us and absorbing CO2. So what's this all mean for the plants we depend on for life? It's all changing messing with our menu. The fourth national climate assessment for agriculture came out last year and they summarized looking to the future as follows, rising temperatures, extreme heat, drought, wildfire, and rangelands and heavy downpours are expected to increasingly disrupt agricultural productivity in the US. And the IPC 1.5 report that came out in October last year more or less confirm this, but on a global scale. So we do face a challenge. Moving on to supply chains. So we talked about 
what climate change the impact is having on individual plants, crops, but supply chains are also at risk. What's pictured here is the Panama Canal, but what's happening, there's a long-term drought in the Panama Canal at the higher elevations, the water level is dropping, it constrains the use of the large ships, so they can't get the big ships through. Total change due to the long-term drought. Right now, today, the Mississippi is flooding and interfering with barge transport. The Mississippi is kind of a main transportation artery for the US. In 2012, there was a flood and a drought when it got too low and they couldn't move the barges. In 13, it flooded. And sea level rise poses a risk to about 60,000 miles of roads and bridges near the coastline. They'll get more risk in the next few decades with the sea level rise. Back to choke points, the lower right is the Strait of Malacca. One third of the soybeans needed by China go through this narrow strait. So any one of these points could be constrained due to changes due to direct result of climate change, social upheaval, military action as a result of climate change. Some of these are on land. So it's something that this group out of the UK, you know, the Chatham House, brought to our attention recently. This is the Arctic sea ice at its sort of minimal stage in September of a few years ago. And the yellow line is where it should be historically. The difference is about 700,000 square miles. But as summer sea ice disappears, it's actually going to open up shipping lanes that are 40% shorter if you're traveling from the North Pacific to Northern Europe or vice versa, this is an opportunity to greatly reduce the cost of transport of goods and food going through the Arctic. How many say they drink beer and they're legal age? This is, um, I use this as a, an example of, you know, all this stuff, all this stuff has to be true because once somebody named a beer after something, global warmer. Has anybody had global warmer? No? Comes in a four pack. Sorry, those of legal age, if you had, anyway, right, I don't care. I just want to know if anybody's ever, it's sold in town here. It comes out of Brooklyn. It is seasonal and I have no idea why it's seasonal, uh, but on the back of the can, it's they have this statement, extended refrigeration at retail magnifies beer's carbon footprint. Please enjoy as soon as possible. It's actually a very good beer too. There's another beer story and there's a brewery in Belgium that has a long, long history. It started in the 1800s and they brew their beer in open vats during the winter time. And the natural yeast come in and start the whole process of fermentation. But what's happening, the winters are getting shorter and they're losing essentially the time they need to brew that beer. So this, this is serious. We're gonna lose one of the world's famous beers because winters are warming in Belgium. So let's, you ready? Maybe you're not hungry, but we'll go out to dinner. The whole system is changing, the menu is changing, growing food is no longer business as usual, supply chains are changing, more volatility, more risk. Now for the, this is such a nice slide, I'm gonna share it with everyone even though you all can't imbibe these special drinks. But I'm gonna start with, anybody know what, when I say the angel share, so a lot of these special spirits are uh, aged out of doors. In some cases, rick houses. They're essentially a house, but they're open to the, on the side. They just have a roof. And there are thousands and thousands, if not millions of barrels being aged all the time. They lose about 2% every year to evaporation, 2% by volume. And it's been kind of a thank you to the angel. It's their share for helping us with this incredible beverage. It's warming up. The angel is taking more. And when you do the calculations, it is tens of millions of gallons of this stuff is now evaporating 
that didn't before when it was cool. The olives, if grown in California, will be subject to loss of winter chill in time. The olive production around the Mediterranean, Mediterranean is really suffering from drought and higher temperatures. Tequila is produced with agave out of Mexico. Well, they had the drought just like California, and agave is a 10-year crop, so four or five of those years were really tough. Yield were down, quality was down, it was putting tequila production at risk. The fruit, it's both like limes. Well, think if they came from Chile or Peru in the wintertime, that would change in the future. Salad, there's no avocados on this, but avocados in California, Mexico are also going to be shifting because of increasing temperatures. I think in 20 years, their production will be cut in half in California. There's a story behind onions. It's not this kind of onion, but the U.S. grows a lot of onions for onion rings in the Pacific Northwest. And they've studied what's happening. At a certain stage of development, if the temperature is high enough, that onion ends up with multiple hearts instead of just one. So it's no longer good for onion rings and the farmer takes a great loss. Wine, wine grapes are very susceptible to changes in temperatures. Could be an opportunity right here for us to grow more reds. Grains and breads, they're going to breads and pasta, et cetera. Probably stable production through the middle of the century towards the end, but kind of decline towards the end of the, with adaptation, but starting to decline towards the end of the century overall. Lobster. If off the coast of Maine, they've pretty much moved north, or in some cases, they now have to put their lobster uh, traps out 50 miles to find the lobster because the water is warming. Shrimp, pretty much gone from the area again for the same reason, warming temperatures. And pizza, the next time you have pizza, stop and think of all the ingredients. So let me see if I can do a few. Anchovies, which I love, they're moving off the coast of South America because of temp changes in the temperature of the ocean. Garlic, if you feed garlic to cows, they produce less methane, but the cheese tastes like garlic. I made that up, I don't have any idea. <laughs> Think of the wheat in the crust, less protein in future. Uh, tomatoes, abort their flowers if daytime temperatures are above 92, nighttime temperatures are above 72. Cheese, hot cows give less milk. It's really fun, well, for some of us, to dig into this. And another one is to do salad dressings. Just start teasing apart what's in the salad dressing, and there's a story behind many of those ingredients. <clears throat> and dessert. Vanilla prices went up substantially, I think fourfold uh, two years ago because of uh, cyclones in Madagascar. Cacao grown in Western Africa, is starting to move to Central America where conditions are better. It's complicated, it's not just climate change. And I've engaged with some coffee advisors in um, Central America and they're helping farmers there switch from coffee to cacao and coffee. People don't like to talk about coffee. I wrote an op-ed on the end of coffee. It was in Fortune mag Magazine a few years ago and the best, you're, when you do these kind of things op-ed, they said, don't ever read the comments because there's people out there that have nothing to do but write really weird things. But the one I liked was, you ain't getting that cup out of my hand until I'm dead. People have a passion for coffee, but it is under great stress. Tropical areas, rainfall patterns are changing, higher temperatures, there's a disease, a rust disease that loves the new conditions and an insect that's also spreading because of the new conditions. They're doing things like shade grown, shade grown coffee, uh, which keeps the temperature down, keeps it cooler, actually enhances bird life, which are good predators on some of the insect pests. Okay, it's always fun to make a list of the things you really enjoy in life when it comes to food. This is mine. The food and the beverages I eat and love and don't, are changing. So I've listed the top three priorities on the left. And then wine, coffee, mashed potatoes with butter and pecan pie. So think of your own list. And then on the other side, there's, there's this sort of thing that I 
I have to eat because my daughter makes me eat it. And that gentleman there, his face is screwed up because my daughter, who he's married to, makes him eat it. I think it's the coffee he doesn't like. I made coffee that morning. So make your own list. See what's changing. Well, let's pause. So most of us in this room, maybe not all, are fortunate to have a meal like that. Three meals a day. But what if? You're part of the world where you're low income, poor, where agriculture is rain fed, you don't, even, you don't have the capacity to irrigate, and generally few resources to adapt. We face a food security challenge, a national security challenge, and a moral challenge. In yesterday's New York Times, there was an article about refugees coming north from Honduras, I believe, because there were, some of them are farmers because the coffee industry is collapsing. There was an article earlier last year, the same thing, covered a broader area, but the issue of climate change refugees is on the horizon and big time by the middle of the century. <clears throat> Few photos from Vietnam. We were fortunate enough to take 10 Cornell students there in January of 2017 and spend two weeks in the Mekong to see climate change first. The cheapest property is right on the shore, the coastline, like pictured upper left. It's a land on water. That water is rising slightly. I'm always amazed, but how many of you have had international experiences associated with Cornell? Just a show of hands. Most, many, yeah. If you get a chance while you're here, please do that. Uh, these experiences are incredible. Um, one of the things we did on the trip was to meet with a group of farmers <clears throat> and the, it's a communist country, so we met with the communist leaders for that particular county. It wasn't called the county, but it's essentially the equivalent. And this was, again, January 2017, and I asked the lead individual, I said, how it, through the interpreter, how is climate change perceived in Vietnam? And he said, well, here we believe in the science. We know it's caused by humans. And in Vietnam, it's not a hoax. And the more you dig, the more you learn. It's not just human food, but think of all the plant-based industries in the world that might also be changing. Pet food, if it's not meat-based, plant-based, think of the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals that are changing. Apparel, cotton, actually will become more and more under more stress unless it's irrigated and that'll become more challenging. Resins and dyes, the French are quite concerned about their high-end perfumes because the higher temperature is essentially changing the chemistry of the flowers, let alone being stressed to grow. Flavors, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, medicinal herbs. Some of these are fairly rare and grow on mountainsides, but conditions are such that it's warming and they're being overtaken, overtaken by invasive species because the invasive species move faster than they do. They're also not flowering or maturing at the same time, so harvest is becoming more complicated. And food additives. So all of these industries are being touched by climate change. Anybody fall in this category? This can be depressing, overwhelming, and we have some options, move, ignore, deny. We're all very busy. Don't bother me with climate change. But it's also not part of our makeup, not in our DNA. I think you've heard this, it's called psychological distance. You know, if it's melting glaciers in the Arctic, well, yeah, it's gonna happen in year 2100, well, that's too far away. I'm not gonna get excited about it. And life is good. So solutions and opportunities. The food and beverage industry, at least the big players, I think you see this in the press, Walmart, Mars, for example, are onto this. They're doing a variety of things to reduce their own greenhouse gas footprints, et cetera. But this organization, BSR, works with these industries and others to help them address climate change. First, 
encourage climate smart farming. That's working with the producer, the source, looking at your supply chain, where are the risks? Consider more frequent storms that will knock the power out to your re giant refrigeration units, to your storage facilities that may interfere with employees getting to work. And higher temperatures are also gonna make it harder to work in the fields, already affecting coffee uh, growers in South America, Central America. Develop and use technology for conservation. That essentially means practice what you preach, reduce your own greenhouse gas point footprint, reduce use, invest in the suppliers, and look at alternative ingredients to minimize your risk. Ben and Jerry's is doing this right now for ice cream. As long as they don't touch chocolate, I'll be okay. Solutions from the National Climate Assessment that came out last year. These are emerging issues, research gaps that need to be filled. Genetic improvement, plant breeding is a big one. More resilient crops and not just yield, but think about quality. Again, back to nutrition. A lot of studies, oh, look what CO2 does to the plant. Look what temperature does to the plant. Look what happens when you take away the water. But what's really needed more of are the interactions. All of those things happening at the same time. Impacts on pests, pathogens, and beneficials. Some of these things are getting out of sync. So an insect pest may emerge first, earlier now with warmer conditions, and the natural enemies later, and maybe too late to actually have what used to be a suppressive effect on the pest. Things are getting out of whack. That's happening with pollinators. Things may be blooming too early, and the pollinators are yet to arrive. Improved modeling of cascading effects on production, food systems, food security. There's also additive effects. So what happens if the Russian wheat crop and the US wheat crop crashes the same year? How do we model for that and deal with it? More emerging issues, soil and carbon, soil and carbon sequestration is really, really important. Truly understand what's going on in the soil. A more systems approach, encompassing vulnerabilities, cost of adaptation and mitigation, big picture, research, social science, barriers to adoption of new strategies. How do we get this out there so people will use it? There might just be opportunities for you in a future career. So Cornell, I'm not sure if this image is copyrighted or whatever or not, but I use it. I made it up. I'm still, well, I guess when you have tenure, you're pretty safe. Anyway, Cornell is really an incredible place when it comes to the nexus of climate change and agriculture and food. We have capacity in plant breeding, developing resilient crops, Susan McCooch, is looking at salt tolerance in rice in the US. We have a South Soil Health Program and a new initiative funded by the state. Water management, we have the Water Resource Institute. There's a lot of people working on management of weeds, insects, plant diseases, and animal diseases. There's a group looking at heat stress and dairy cattle. We have the Northeast Climate Center, which among others looks at climate modeling and extreme weather. And in communication, I suspect there's six or eight faculty who have climate change in their portfolio. Of course, we have outreach, renewable energy, and a lot more, and a lot of partnerships. So you're pretty fortunate to be at this place right now in this time. The USDA created climate change hubs a few years ago. There's seven across the US and they're charged to help coordinate and build partnerships because of the nature of this challenge. I'm with the Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions. Essentially we're there to help farmers in the Northeast stay in business as the normal change. It's no longer normal. We foster and support climate smart agriculture. We have an extension team. This is six extension educators around the state, part of which their salary, we pay a small part of their salary so that they include climate change in the programming. And decision tools. How can we help the producers make the right decisions in this new world? And also there is a lot of interest 
in the urban, in the, from the urban sector in these same issues. There's a climate stewards program. If you're familiar with master gardeners, it's kind of the equivalent, but focused on climate change. Volunteers out there spreading the word about climate change and helping others. Climate smart farming has key strategies, focus on soil health, effective water management, ecologically based pest management, diversify financial re resiliency is like spread your risk, reduce livestock stress, and long-term planning. You've got to look to the future. You've got to look out farther than next year's profit margin and make the right kind of investments. This is one of the tools I mentioned, decision tool. This is actually it's called climate change in your county. And on the left, there is a so the map of the Northeast. You can click on any county in the Northeast US and ask for things like precipitation, uh, down, the number of downpours, so to speak, the uh, changes in amount of precipitation, temperature, growing degree days, which are essentially an accumulation of warmth. And what you get is on the right, upper, on upper right, is essentially, put in this case, this is growing degree days from 1950 to current times. And during the growing season, there's essentially more warmth accumulating. Plants grow faster. But you'll also see that the last 30 years, it's actually gone even faster. Now, the lower right is looking to the future. It predicts out what, how much in change will happen, increase in growing degree days towards the years 2100. And again, you can do this for temperature and a variety of things. And this is really valuable for communities when they look at precipitation patterns changing in the future. And some of the other tools. So if I'm a farmer, I go to the site, go to the website, I actually put in my location, so they're site specific, what kind of crop I'm growing, if they need what kind of soil, and it'll calculate out for my area, growing degree days for a particular crop. It'll calculate out if I need irrigation on a particular crop and when, this is a 30 day, pred a 30 day prediction, which is really valuable. That's not what farmers have had in the past. There's another one on cover crops, which they plant, farmers plant in the fall to hold the soil in place, increase carbon, but it gets kind of tricky late in the fall. Well, can I still plant and get a good crop over winter? This helps with that. And lastly, frost risk. Again, I mentioned earlier, we lost most of our apples and cherries. Now this frost risk tool gives a producer about a four day window, kind of a heads up, it's gonna be really cold, prepare. What can we do? By all this. I like what Bill McKibben says. Push for changes big enough to matter. We can all do the small things. They're important. But we reached a point where we've got to make some big changes. And Mary Pfeiffer wrote, wrote this book, The Green Boat, a few years ago, and I like it. And she, by herself, made a difference. And she recommends we get informed, accept the truth, the old shoot moment, and then act. Be informed, be a climate change literate person. A person who is climate literate understands the essential principles of Earth's climate systems, the likely impacts of climate change, understands the cost and benefits of climate change mitigation adaptation, notes how to assess credible information, can communicate effectively about climate change, and is able to make informed decisions. At Cornell, the employee assembly, the student assembly, and the university assembly have all passed climate change resolutions that everyone here should be climate change literate. This is a path we're taking, a few of us. Can we draw attention to climate change through food? We worked with someone in communication. He said, there is no literature on this topic. Your beliefs and attitudes about climate change can be affected by politics, religion, age, et cetera, or where you live. But no one's really looked at how you can use food to change people's minds. And everybody eats. Now, melting glaciers are bad enough, but the loss of coffee is downright terrifying. I hope that gets attention. 
So here's a little exercise you can do if you like at some point. The next time you eat, use your smartphone or computer, type in climate change and any word you want, any food, and see what happens. I mentioned, I think I touched almost every one of these already. Kiwi. There weren't any kiwis out of Peru a couple of years ago because of one of those false springs. Tea, the flavor of tea is changing because where they grow it, the rain is falling at a different time and it's affecting the quality of teas. So everything is changing. And we're writing a book, essentially with the same title as this seminar, our, cha our, our changing menu, what climate change means to the foods we need to love. So when it's out, you might want to read it and buy it. Paperback won't be that expensive. It'll be out next year. But it's one way we think we can start to get people's attention, more so about climate change and to act. If you have not had a chance to look at Drawdown, Paul Hawkins is the editor of this. It's a remarkable book on the things that we can do that matter. And if you go down the list, you will see related to food, number three. Basically, this starts at the top. And by the time you get to the bottom, we're pretty much back where we should be as far as greenhouse gas, gases in the atmosphere, more or less. And it's obviously going to take time. But I was surprised that actually refrigerant management could be a big player. But if you look down at number three, it's reduced food waste. And number four, a plant-rich diet. I still eat meat. Not that much, but I do eat meat. And I think we ought to be careful also when we state that everybody should stop eating meat without considering where else in the world that animal is used for transportation, for milk, it's their tractor, and they may also eat the meat. Taking action, kind of pulling everything together. Sometimes I give seminars on climate change and hope. Remember, you are not alone. This can be overwhelming. There are a lot of ways to solve this grand challenge. One person can only do so much. But I have to look at the side myself on occasion. So find one thing you can do best and most effectively and focus on that instead of trying to solve everything. Don't give up and raise your voice. We all eat. And a note of a podcast coming up. I'm done. I'm just sharing this message about next week on the 23rd. Down to earth, coronal conversations about climate change. Uh, there's a panel of us. I'm fortunate to be part of that, but you might want to listen in. Uh, Danielle Eisman right here is the organizer of that. So with that, thank you. Um, I've heard some say that um, animal agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to climate change, and I've heard others deny that. What's what's what up? was the culture idea? I'm sorry, animal, animal. agriculture. Uh, what's your opinion on that? What's your view? Yes, it is a major contributor of greenhouse gases. Um, there's different ways to raise those animals and so on. There's the giant feedlot where you're bringing materials in, etc., and take it out. Um, but it is one of the bigger players. And just in the state of New York, I found this intriguing in that uh, because we have all these other, we have transportation, energy, or electricity production that are huge contributors. Agriculture is about 3% of the total pool, but most of it comes from enteric methane from dairy cows. So yeah, it, um, I guess I'm answering your question, your question with a yes, animal production is a big deal. But I, and I also said we need to be sensitive to the rest of the world and how those animals
do you think that um, as options become less variable for, I guess, restaurants or um, just stores in general, that food, the transportation of food will become more of a problem um, for contribution to greenhouse gases? Because I guess, like, I don't know, uh, supermarket will start importing uh, anchovies from a greater distance, which I guess, yeah, contribute more to global warming. I mean, there, there's going to be shifts in production. The trajectory the U.S. is on is actually to import more and more fruit and vegetables, for example. I think that's driven primarily uh, to a large extent because of labor shortages in the U.S. So, in fact, we're going to be bringing more in potentially from further away. I guess the counter to that is what can we do more locally? Um, and maybe we won't have anchovies to go on the pizza. And at some point, we're going to have to accept that and a lot of other things. Um, uh, I know you talked a lot about how, how climate change is impacting what we eat, but could you expand a little bit more on how what we eat impacts climate change? And how what we eat impacts climate to, change, yeah. Sure. Well, I think you could look at any point on the food chain, starting at production. And I mean, the big, the big one is, op is deforestation. We're opening up land around the world for grazing, for production of crops. That's a huge contributor to greenhouse gases. And because uh, the organic matter breaks down and carbon is released, so that starts there. Um, and then transportation is another issue. So I think there's, there's a whole sphere, you know, the amount of energy for storage of products. Then think about packaging. Then think about, you know, everything at the retail and storage. But I would suggest that every one of those points, we can also be doing a better job. Better packaging, more efficient energy use for storage, et cetera. Um, you know, we, everything doesn't have to be wrapped in, they call them clamshells. Um, you know, so there's, there's ways to improve the entire system. Hi. Um, do you think we should proactively change our diets now in response to climate change? Yes. How so? Well, the big one, I guess, is, is uh, reduce meat consumption. It, it's complicated. Um, you know, people say, uh, back to my comment about locally grown, so it's not always easy to say this, this is better than this, but you know, cause they can transport lettuce from California probably with a much, well not probably, with a much lower greenhouse gas footprint than sometimes you can grow it locally. Cause it's coming in by rail, which is very efficient. Um, so I think, and I would suggest there's someone else in this room a lot smarter on this topic than me, but you know, the market drives a lot of stuff. You can uh, not buy certain things at the marketplace or talk to the retailer and say, you know, for the following reasons, I think you ought to be carrying A, B, C instead of what you carry now. Um, I know that um, partly due to climate change and partly due to like just increased transportation of goods that a lot of new like invasive species continually get introduced to like uh, agricultural regions. And since you're like entomology, um, could you maybe talk about, uh, I guess how much like people are working to combat against like the invasive species uh, problem for agriculture? Not enough, but it is happening. I mean, there are uh, the beginnings of like citizen science programs, say in this part of the world, in the Northeast, essentially people with their iPhone photographing something and it's a, it's a new record it's moving north, that kind of thing. I mean, there's already uh, land grant and, and private consultants out there monitoring, but that's one example of trying to stay ahead of the curve. Um, we actually, a group of us submitted a large, very large USDA grant about a year ago. We have not heard yet if it's going to be funded, but part of that was to, in fact, um, develop it even further so that the Canadians would have a heads up. Hey, you know, by 2021, X is going to be in your backyard because we could kind of predict that. So yes, and we at, at Cornell, we also have an invasive species research institute 
And that's one of the things they do. Hello. So I know you talked a lot about, uh, well, you, you said that Cornell's like a good place for climate change and stuff. So I was just wondering what you think about Cornell divesting from fossil fuels. When I speak, I get three questions. <laughs> One is, what do I think of nuclear power? What do I, what's my opinion on population? Third is genetically modified organisms. And that your question is appropriate for here. Um, I will give you my personal opinion and that would be, it's great. It's symbolic. Um, seeing that some of the plants and seeds are going to be changing in the future, do you think it's important that we try to preserve seed diversity in seed banks? And if so, are there any areas of the world right now where there's a lot of seed diversity, plant diversity that we still haven't collected and that we should focus on? Yeah, I think it's more important now than ever to maintain that diversity because somewhere in there, there could be the resilient gene to who knows, salt tolerance or some other factor or some, because we, the crops, we, we say, well, it's got to be more heat tolerant or this tolerant, but it's really just got to be more resilient, just sort of the, the, the extreme. So I think it's critically important that we maintain and accumulate as much of that gene, genetic material as possible. I don't um, have a specific example of, um, oh, it's sort of on the negative side. It was in the press recently that uh, maybe a couple months ago that almost all of the wild coffee genes are going to disappear. And some of those are in little niches where, you know, if the temperature changes at all, you know, there's, they can't move. They're not, there's no plasticity. They're not just going to be planted somewhere else. They're really tightly aligned uh, ecologically to a little space. But that's kind of on the downside, but of course there were people responding, yes, we need to bring that material together and it takes, it's expensive, because then you've got to propagate it year after year, et cetera, once you collect it. Um, so I didn't have a positive example, I had kind of a negative one, but coffee, coffee was in the press for that reason. Um, you mentioned that labor shortages in the U.S. are a main reason, or there are contributing to challenges in, in food production. I'm wondering if you've seen anything about uh, demographic changes in the United States, age demographic changes being uh, factored into projections about food production in the next century. I don't have a good example to, um, to share. Uh, I mean, we're essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, we're in a bit of an aging population. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to eat 10 years from now, but uh, I, I don't. And there's a lot of incentives for younger farmers to help their agriculture. Uh, but in terms of helping labor with agriculture, we do have a large immigrant population that does come here um, to help with harvesting crops. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, but I, I don't recall the specific statistics on that. Um. This is Danielle Eisman. She's one of the co-authors on the book. And a bunch of other things. What do you think is the best or most effective way to change people's attitudes about eating less meat? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that sort of in a broader context. It's like having a conversation with someone who doesn't necessarily agree with you on climate change. And a way to start is to simply listen, you know, where they're coming from, where they're at, what their beliefs are. Um, but once you sort of have an opening, I would suggest, and if, obviously they have to understand, understand climate change, but um, there are, you know, the data are out there. You know, if you look at the greenhouse gas footprint from beef production, et cetera, it's just kind of off the chart versus most everything else. So then you, then you offer them some data. So this question might be a little bit out of your expertise, but do you think uh, humans would sort of adapt to the nutrient deficiencies that you've sort of predicted will occur in 2050? 
I'm sorry, I didn't catch. So in 2050, you, one of the slides had a bunch of oh. like nutrient deficiencies that you expect humans to have. Do you think humans would start um, adapting to those, uh, those needs that we're getting? There was a, I actually did not include a PowerPoint that goes into the details of what uh, iron deficiencies will result in and protein deficiencies and um, women carrying children. They're pretty significant impacts, but I don't, I'm not a human physiologist. I would suggest in that time frame that we should be and could be breeding crops that sort of compensate for that loss. Um, so I know that the government spends a lot of money uh, subsidizing and um, providing, you know, yield insurance for farmers. Um, has climate change impacted the premiums farmers pay? Or is it not impacted? I'm not sure about the premiums, but the amount of payments have gone way up because of crop loss. Um, are you hopeful that we can reduce our emissions globally as of right now, or do you think we should be more focused on adaption um, as a whole, I guess? It's, it's all hands on deck. We've got to approach both with everything we can, both adaptation and mitigation. I'm going to avoid your question about hope. So oh, is your opinion that GMOs are going to be part of the solution? Will GMOs be part of the solution? Yes. I think the, uh, the science behind genetically engineered crops is solid. Um, they are safe. It's the implementation that results in problems. You know, um, the widespread use of uh, Roundup ready crops, soybean, corn, et cetera. The weed society predicted a long time ago that would result in resistant weeds and now we have these super weeds. Um, but so it's, it's the actual genetically engineered output or the crop I think is acceptable. We just have to be careful on how it's implemented. And obviously there's a whole issue of equity and justice and who gets them and who doesn't. Um, all of those issues need to be weighed. Okay, let's thank um, Mike again.